Thank you. Hello, can I start? No, you have to wait. I have to introduce you first. Okay, yeah, that's what <laughs> I was waiting for. People have to come in. Uh, Okay, shall we start? I think because we're at 39, so the room is open. Good afternoon and greetings um, wherever you are. It might not be the afternoon, it might be a different time zone. So uh, welcome to you all to the third day of the Sawas Festival of Ideas on Decolonizing Knowledge. My name is Amina Yakin. I'm the director of the Sawas Festival of Ideas and um, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this afternoon's session with Professor Neelam Hussain, who will be delivering the third and final part of her lecture series that we have been enjoying over the last uh, few weeks. Uh, I will just introduce Neelam briefly and then just give you a background into the lectures that she's done so far and then hand over to her. The format of the session will be that Neelam will uh, talk for about 40 to 50 minutes and take questions at the end. I would invite uh, audience members to put their questions in the Q&A box. We won't be taking questions uh, live from people, well, live in the Q&A box, but we because of time, because we have to finish by 4.45 uh, for the next session. So we're just going to take the questions in the box and um, I'll read them out and Neelam will respond to them. So it'd be great if you can keep them coming during the session, as it were. <clears throat> so uh, it's it's a pleasure to introduce Neelam, who did her, her BA Honours in English Literature from Kinnaird College, Lahore, and um, read for the MA degree at Government College, Lahore, followed by an MA from Leeds in the United Kingdom and her postgraduate research at Sussex. Uh, she's been a lecturer at Kinnett College and as well as um, at the, at, she also lectures at Lahore College, I believe. And uh, she left um, Kinnett to work at Seymour Women's Resource and Publication Center in 1995 and has been there since. Seamurg is a secular feminist not-for-profit organization and apart from overall oversight as executive coordinator, her work entails direct involvement in both academic and field research, including the editing and publication of um, a journal called Bayan, which has got a legal uh, connection, uh, context to it. And there are many other publications and um, her other work includes the production and publication of an annotated selection of Punjabi folk tales documented by British folklorists during the Raj and translation from Urdu to English of two novels in a courtyard by Khatija Mastur and All Passion Spent by Zahida Hena. She's also the co-editor of two volumes on engendering the nation state, which are available in the Sawaz library and as well as the editor of a recent publication, Disputed Legacies, the Pakistan Papers. Neelam is Professor of Practice with us here at SOAS, and I, um, she has been delivering, as I said, um, a couple of lectures before today's one. So this is a continuation of the conversation on narrative. She has talked so far about the Punjabi folk or wonder tale and followed by Angan or the Inner Courtyard in Afshan, two novels by women writers. And today she's going to be talking about oral narratives, memories from the margins. Neelam, welcome and over to you. Thank you, Amna. Uh, today I'll be looking at oral narratives or histories categorized as subjugated or disqual disqualified knowledges to examine the gaps, disjunctions, and disconnects between two different knowledge and narrative forms, namely the discursive field of erudite scientific knowledge, official history, and formal fact-based texts, and the unofficial, unverified 
non-commonsensical knowledges that belong to the domain of orality and people's voices. In order to highlight the importance of it, uh, and, and the aim of this is to highlight the importance of dialogic space between the two so as to bridge the distance between official academic discourse and the unqualified knowledges based on what people know at the local level and which according to Foucault derive their power from the fact that they are different from the knowledge forms that surround them. Uh, you might object that, uh, no, that's sorry, that I don't want to read. The strength of oral history lies in, the, in its immediacy, in the direct, historically positioned, open-ended polyphony of the spoken word. Unlike the terms of conventional academic writing that insists on a chronologically bound sequential relationship between cause and effect and action and impact, and which discards all that is extraneous and unverifiable, oral history or oral narratives rely on the uncertain terrain of memory and emotional recall. They have little respect for sequential logic or even chronological order carried on the different voices and languages of the marketplace, the street, the intimacies of the domestic enclosure and local gossip, they quicken to life in the dialogic terrain of open-ended conversations and spin out of what Foucault refers to as a singular, uh, as singular local knowledges, as well as memories and points of view that link the past to the present and anticipate the future. Drawing upon the seemingly unnecessary, unnecessary detail and minute, minutiae of life on popular wisdoms, people's subjugated knowledges, and the collective memory of struggles and combats, oral narratives capture people's lives not as objects of research, but as subjects caught in the interdeterminacy of the spoken word, which are also mo the moments of what Bakhtin calls maximal open-ended contact with the present. In the process, they breathe life into the case studies of mainstream academic discourse, which is not to say that this is an argument for oral history as opposed to formal academic research, but a recognition of what it elides and the importance of both in tandem with each other. An argument for dialogic spaces between the singular, singular self-referentiality of expert knowledge and erudition and the multi-axial interdeterminate performity of oral narratives. The importance of acknowledging the connection between these two forms of knowledge cannot be underestimated, not only as an exercise that deepens the formal academic endeavor, but because it draws attention to that which is sub elided, subjugated, shed as extraneous and unverifiable, to that which falls through the cracks of formally accepted knowledge and is rendered invisible by the grand narratives of power, of official history and the discursive fields of law, morality, religion, and human rights, as well as the terms and terminology of negotiation and expediency that shape the political and ideological parameters of our world as part of ongoing historical process. The need to recognize, retrieve, and engage with the submerged knowledges and unacknowledged lives of the people is important, not because it will take us to the truths of history, but because this engagement with people's voices, with the world as they understand and experience it, has the potential of enabling us to see with a critical and objective eye what the orthodoxies of grand narratives mask, what they include and what is excluded, and what interests they serve. In today's neoliberal world, where the right to choose is reduced to consumerist choices and the profit mo motive takes precedence over everything that is worth preserving as, offic as official narratives make and unmake the, the lives and stories of ordinary people, this, as I've said earlier, is important. I will illustrate my argument with conversations and stories. The first set stems from 1947, when Lahore, and I quote here from an official text, when Lahore experienced some of the worst rioting during the period preceding the formation of Pakistan. Uh, accompanied by the loss and departure of the city's Hindu and Sikh populations to India. If, if, if there is time, the second set comprises stories of sexual violence and the subversion of the male gaze. The first set of stories is drawn from fragments of personal memory, 
and conversations and interviews with women undertaken for different research projects in, in Lahore's walled city over the past 10 or more years. The stories are about relationships and locale, not so much as a geographically defined and politically circumscribed place as defined by Anthony Giddens, but as a historically and socially circumscribed place of an organically developed mosaic of communities, cultures, relationships, values, and a way of life shaped in the tangle of streets, monuments made homely by the rituals of use, shrines, muhallas, neighborhoods, and havelis that are the walled city. My first story lies on the other side of the official narratives of the rise and fall of kingdoms empires and iconic figures credited with the making of Lahore's history and architectural build. It stemmed from one question in a conversation with a group of women of different ages in one of their homes in the in Delhi Darwaza. And it took us to a world beyond the bare bone facticity of the overused phrase, Lahore experienced some of the worst rioting during partition. Sitting with women in Delhi Darwaza, sometime in the early 2000s, someone had asked, who are these diyas for? Diyas are little clay lamps. What diyas? The ones, uh, the next, uh, next uh, slide, please. The next one, yeah, this one. The ones in the niches and ledges that dot the streets. There are so many of them. They're in almost in every home we've gone to. Oh, they're for the others who live here, one of the women had replied. What others? For those who did not leave. By now we were all listening. It's this way. During the facade, the conflict, the Hindus and Sikhs who lived here went away and we moved into their houses. But all of them didn't go. Many were lost and left behind. These diyas are for them. You mean you liked them for those who died in the partition riots? No, we liked them for the ones who stayed. We feel their presence. They're here. Come on. Has anyone seen them? Many have. Sometimes on waking at night, there is someone in the room, then whoever it is vanishes. Aren't you scared? No, they're not antagonistic. They share the space with us. We like the us for them. It has been said subaltern discourses show how people engage with history at intense and personal levels, not through the lens of official histories and academic tests, texts, but by individual relationships with places and people and spaces. The same may be said of oral narratives. And in sitting there in the palimpsest of mazy streets and tall crumbling houses of the walled cities, many layered history, where in cautious digging can uncover a lost passage or the floor of a room cave in on an underground chamber with murals dim with old dust, where even the ground beneath the feet is uncertain. The story is certainly believable. Sometimes in the 1990s, when we were, we were collecting partition narratives, I asked my cousin Jamil about those days. He must have been about 12 then and recalled a small boy's uh, small imperceptible changes as seen by the eyes of a small boy. The dropping off of customary greetings between neighbors, the cessation of roof rooftop flirtations, the turning aside of one's familiar glances. My cousin Gogi's memories, next please, are less impressionistic, more detailed. Looking back, she recalls the house in Batala now in India and a way of life, the sense of place and permanence, the mounting tension, the shock of the Radcliffe Award, the redrawing of boundaries, the departure for Lahore and loss of home. I called her the next day to thank her and ask if my colleague Sadia Thur and I could have another session to tie up some loose ends. No, she said abruptly, I don't want to talk about that time. I thought I'd done with it, but you made it live again. Moving on to 1963 on a family visit to India for the first time in my life, I saw two grown men cry. My father and Inder Prakash Nanda, his friend from pre-partition FC College Lahore. They had met after a separation of 15 years, sharpened with the possibility of never meeting again. His wife would not see her. She had lost her brothers to the flame of Shahalmi, and her memories had another trajectory. For me, the visit to Delhi was strangely disturbing, almost, un almost uncanny. 
in its experience of entering a familiar world where I knew the streets, the faces, where I knew the faces, the language, even the humor, yet which I could not own to, and to which I did not belong. Many years later, in the 1990s, when my friend Anu came to Lahore from Delhi, she had a similar experience. I don't know why, but I seem to go around with a lump in my throat, she said. History put paid to the two nation theory with Bangladesh. It also brought about changes in life patterns, leaving it to different generations to pick up the threads in other lands of stories severed in 47 and then again in 71. For me, it began in Leeds with Shama Fateh Ali from Bombay who kept the connection alive through a string of letters across the border until the end of her life. And with Anu Kapoor and Kumkum Sangari whose mothers like me had been st students at Kinnaird and where I was now, now a teacher, and Anu's father who had gone to government college Lahore, where I read for my MA degree. It was the beginning of a friendship that took me to Delhi, and Anu's mother, who would say, ah, Lord, the younger Lankari, come, let's talk about Lahore. In a parallel gesture, my khalu, my uncle, traversed the nooks and corners of Delhi with Anu, when, but when asked to visit, replied, Delhi was my city. I will not go there as a stranger. And there was Kumkum and there was Kumkum Kum Sandrub with whom I went, a Muslim women, woman from Pakistan with a Hindu boy who sang the Kawali at the Mazar to pay my respects to Khusru and Nizamuddin and where for his sake I was given a welcome I did not merit. Did our elders ever count the cost, I often wonder, of what it would take to carve a new nation out of the living body of the, of the land? Or were they driven pell-mell by the forces of history over which they had little control? Who can tell? Anyway, from the discontinuities of history, let us move on to its continuities, which exist alongside, it, al al alongside them and point to abiding connectivities, to something stronger than the politically created antagonisms and exclusive narratives that divide us, that divide us today. One such space is represented by the eclectic, eclectic, undifferentiated inclusivity of the Sufi Mazar or shrine and the popular belief systems that have grown around it and by inference to its role in the making of the, the subcontinents in the Indo-Muslim history and culture, where the sacred and profane intermingle and the extraterrestrial jinns, churels come together on the same terrain with holy men and ordinary people and shed doubt on the exclusivities of religious, ethnic, national, and other differences that set and reinforce the parameters of official history. The next story, also from the walled city, was recounted by my friend Farid and colleague Farid Dasher, and is to do with the Mazar culture. Walking down a narrow street during a field visit to the walled city, she and the research team had spotted a tree through an archway. It was an unexpected sight in the densely built environment. They had gone in and found themselves in a largish courtyard with an old name tree. Scores of diyas were placed among its roots. Uh, next, please. Farida asked who the shrine, be shrine belonged to. And this is where the folk tale meets up with the non-commonsensical subjugated knowledges, a not unexpected phenomenon in, in what is still a predominantly oral culture. To Mai was the reply, who is Mai? You see the Haveli on the left? It belongs to Alif Shah. A Churel or a witch woman, a shapeshifter had fallen in love with him. Taking the guise of a beautiful woman, she proposed marriage to him. Alif Shah agreed, but as in all fairy sto stories or folk tales, on one condition that she would not betray, give away the secret of her identity. She agreed. And they lived, they got married and lived happily for many years. Till one stormy night, when Alif Shah was entertaining guests, a gust of wind blew out the lamp. Without thinking, his wife, who was serving food, stretched out her hand to the next room for a wick of light. There and then, Alif Shah ended the relationship and told her to leave the house. Bound by her word, the Churel could not refuse. But she could not bear to leave Alif Shah either. So she took up residence in the neem tree outside and she's, she's been living there ever since. Farida had asked the raconteur, and what does Alif Shah have to say to that? 
oh, this happened a, a very long time ago. The Haveli now belongs to the sons of his sons. And the Diyas, girls liked them. They come to ask the Mai's favor for marriage, for jobs, to pass exams, to cast a blight on the other woman, whatever. They bring the lamps and light them. Turning to a ped woman peddler in the corner of the courtyard, Farida had asked, do you believe in the Mai? The woman gave her a look and said, I'm not saying. For all I know, she may be sitting up there listening. In his quite fascinating book, Genealogy, Vivek Anand Taneja discusses the shrine culture in the medieval ruins of Firosha Kotla in Delhi with its extraterrestrial component of Jin saints. As an and he sees it as an encounter, as a counter to dis as a counter discourse to national historiography written in post-partition India, portraying the birth of two separate and hostile nation states as, as historical inevitability. And I'll quote directly, I'll read directly from him. The images of the past seen among the medieval ruins of India in ritual and dream point to a different relationship between the past to present. The saintly visions that persist among the ruins through indexing other potentials of the medieval than those remembered by national colonial historiography destabilize the time of the present. The inevitability of things as they are in the here and now. This destabilization, the presence of multiple pasts in the time of the present is important for the remaking of individuals and communities, the potential for future alternatives. Here, the past exists as a field of potential what could have been and what could, what could be again, which destabilizes the inevitability of the present state of affairs. It gives us what to think. It also takes one back to the folk tales and the terrain of the wonder tale where the distinguishing boundaries between the extraterrestrial and the fantastic and the real are obliterated. Anyway, it gives one to think certainly, my third story belongs to the ter terrestrial domain, based on, but it is also a partition story. Based on an interview with Kalpana Devi from Sakhar city in Sindh on the abduction and forced conversion of Hindu girls to Islam, it draws attention to the move from the pattern set by the active conflict of partition to the politics of conflict that mark the relationship of the nations carved out, carved out in 1947 and continues to impact on the lives of religious minorities on both sides of the border. Where her position as respected human rights lawyer and a member of a mainstream political party enables her to address and take on the issue of forced conversions and speak critically, boldly, or reflectively on cases of abduction and cross-religion marriage, her identity as a member of the Hindu minority in a society increasingly polarized on the basis of religion is reflected in the variability of tone and pitch of voice and in the hesitations that mark her speech. However, it is her silences that are the most telling. In speaking about cases of Hindu girls who have converted to Islam, either willingly or unwillingly, and whose return to their original faith or even interaction with their families is forbidden by the, the majority community in the name of Islam, she is faced with an impasse. Although there is no statutory law on apostasy in Pakistan and conversion from Islam to another religion is not a criminal offense. The power of post-Islamization popular belief backed by local feudals and religious terrorism and extremists makes the absence of such a law immaterial. To openly condemn or criticize this practice masquerading as law is for Kalpana to lay herself open to mob violence. To remain silent is to condone an injustice and ignore the agony of young girls and families caught in an impossible situation. So what does she do? She deflects attention to other areas, to youthful waywardness and celluloid romance. To, she, may have a, she may have a point there, except that the issue of cross-religion marriages in Pakistan, particularly Sindh, is not a about going astray and love without the gloss of marriage only. Standing on the slippery slope of the othered community, she can only suggest palliative measures, such as safe houses where girl have, girls have time to reconsider their decision and raising the age of voluntary conversion to 18. Which is not to say this was a poor interview. 
On the contrary, the silences, ambiguities, evasions and omissions, as well as moments of emotional intensity that capture the anguished voices of girls separated from their families, of girls refused house room by their parents and siblings for reasons of honor, caste purity and family shame, of politics of religion and caste and of girls bought and sold and sold yet again, encapsulate an entire history of sexual and gender-based violence that peaked with the capture and rape of women and their, and their subsequent rejection by families on both sides of the, of the India-Pakistan border in 1947 and continues to unfold today along a discursive tra trajectory and non-discursive practices set more, than 50, set more than 70 years ago. This more than anything else argues not for the replacement of the specialized erudition of academics and experts and the makers of official histories with the subjugated knowledges that subsist in the margins and the value and role of disqualified knowledges that people have, but for acknowledgement and engagement between the two. For what, should be a, for what should be a major global concern today, namely the nature and composition of peace in today's world, as testified by Palestine, Yemen, Afghanistan, the unheard voices of Syria, and indeed Pakistan and India. These are paradigmatically a move from, the, from active war to the politics of war. In such contexts, the sanctity of human emotions and relationships, and indeed of humanity itself, have little value. Driven by the hegemonic interests of capitalist patriarchy that reduce, reduces, that reduce narratives of displacement and loss to collateral damage, even as the fetishized bodies of women continue to function as objects of exchange, as markers of identity, as property, signifiers of honor, as property to be sold and trafficked, bought into marriage as labor, bartered for peace, debased and abused, but also on occasion as agents and rebels, defiant and therefore potentially dangerous and meriting surveillance. Oral narratives in, informed by emotional memory of dis, the emotional memory of displacement and loss unmasks mask the politics of language, of what lies behind words such as refugees, displacement, migration, illegal immigrants. They question the grand narratives of nationhood and home, homeland, draw attention to a terrain where multiple temporalities come together as articulations of the absences and scarcities all that is unverifiable and intangible that informs people's lives. We need to question existing hierarchies of knowledge and give house room to the disqualified knowledges that people have. And in the process, we also need to write our stories, to rewrite our stories. Uh, that's the end of the first lot. Do we have time for the second, Anna? Hello? Yes, you have, um, you have about another 10 minutes would that give you okay. enough time? yeah and, i can't and, hear you very well but i i get, get the signal that i can continue you can and i'd just like to invite the audience to please put your questions in the q a feature that is at the bottom of the zoom screen while neelam is talking so that we can move uh, fluently into that section as soon as she's okay talking. so my first set of stories belong to 1947 the second for the second I begin with a reference. It is, in fact, my second set of stories are framed by a reference to, to Aminata Forno's article, We Must Take Back Our Stories and Reverse the Gaze. She refers to psychologist Boris Cyrulnik's work on post-traumatic stress disorders among child survivors of the Nazi occupation of France. Speaking about the difference in response between children who took part in the resistance and who suffered the lowest levels of depression as opposed to others who did not. Cyrulnik highlights the link between resilience and storytelling to show that traumatic events are framed by the narratives given to them. Not only do they impact the subject's sense of selfhood, but also determine her his rate of survival. I would go one step further and say they the way we frame the narrative also determines the direction the narrative can take. 
The significance of the next story, which is about a young woman's quest for justice, lies not in, only in the determination with which she pursued her case, but in the terms of her struggle, in the steps she took to reverse the, the dominant case and in the reframing of her story. Uh, uh, the case study, I've drawn the case study from a paper by Afia Zia, uh, titled Subverting Her Sex, uh, in, uh, that was published in the Seymour publication on uh, called Disputed Legacies and was part of a joint regional South Asian regional venture initiated by Zuban in New Delhi. Uh, the bare bones of the case again in 200, 2011 in Mirpur Khas, 17 year old Asya Khoso was subjected to gang rape. The local police refused to register her case on the grounds that the medical legal report had documented her as a virgin, and there was no bodily evidence of, of a rape crime. This is fairly common in the smaller cities where the, where the victim belongs to a lower class and the perpetrator has the power to influence the police not to record the crime. It's not an uncommon story. But against all expectations, Kosu and her father refused to accept the local Jirga decision to resolve the issue by marrying her to one of the rapists. They pursued the case with the human rights lawyer Zia Awan in Karachi. A high level medical board repeated Koso's physical examination and, and confirmed that the victim was not a virgin. Koso held a press conference where she publicly announced her lab status. 17 year old Koso reversed the male gaze to reclaim and rewrite her own story. In the process, she stripped female virginity of its symbolic value, shattered the universality of rape as fate worse than death, and transformed both rape and virginity into empty signifiers, thereby striking a blow at the very foundations of patriarchal systems. By reducing the terms to their literal biological meaning, she struck a blow at the very foundations of the patriarchal order that uses female virginity as a tool to control and manipulate female sexuality and as the terrain where male battles for power are waged. The, my second story takes us to Balochistan and is based on Huma Fuladi's paper for the same publication on forced marriages. Uh, Saima, the case story is called Saima story. It's a fictitious name. Uh, for reasons of uh, respecting her identity. Uh, to break down the story for a quick retelling, the first act of violence that triggered Saima's story was the forced marriage. She was educated, lived in Quetta, but from a respectable but not very well-off family. Her father received a proposal from her, for her, from a socially better placed family, but the young man was not particularly educated. Saima gave in to the pressure and married him. The second act of violence, which then moves her story a step further, was the ritual or custom where to prove that the girl is, that the bride is a virgin on the night after the wedding, the wedding when the marriage has been consummated, a blood-stained sheet is displayed to family members. Saima failed the test. There was no blood on the sheet. The result was a series of violent actions perpetrated by her father-in-law, by her family members. Not unusual, it is, happens to many girls except that Saima took it for a while and then spoke to her family about it. And this triggered off a series of transgressions on her part. Her father came to her father-in-law and asked that Saima should be sent back to the family and he asked for a divorce. Saima's father-in-law refused on the grounds that this was an internal family matter and he had nothing to, he had no business interfering. Saima's father took the case to the local Jirga and uh, raised enough of a fuss for the Jirga to call a 
meeting at the Jirga where Saima was presented, uh, was present, was presented before the Jirga. Uh, her father-in-law openly abused her and vilified her character. Saima again broke the norm and asked permission to speak. She said, I mean, basically she asked for them to examine. She said there was a fault in, the, in her husband that he could not have sex. She asked them to examine him. The Jirga did. They found Saima was right. And suddenly the terms of the tale were overturned. By claiming agents, by claiming voice and agency, she had done more than challenge one man's masculinity. She, ch ch she had challenged the parameters of patriarchal author authority th thresholds. She had switched places with her husband in the honor shame dy dyad and shaken the complacency of the symbolic order. The blood stained sheet underwent a double transformation. As, uh, the, as it, as a, uh, it's the absence uh, of the blood-stained sheet had been a signifier of Saima's shame. By her action, it became a visible sign of her honor and a testimony to her husband's shame and the absent manhood. which doesn't mean that Saima's issue was resolved happily. Patriarchal for the forces gathered together again. The Jirga reneged on its uh, first uh, understanding. They said, no, no, there was nothing wrong with the man. The girl, however, did go back to her family. The marriage ended, but Saima's in-laws, on the basis of some technical law point, refused to give her a divorce. I don't know what the current status of the scene is, but when last heard of, the situation was still hanging fire. She could not marry again. She could not do anything. And she was vilified as someone who had been shameless enough to bring shame to her husband. That is as may be. These, But these stories do represent a step, a different step in the normal flow of the, sto of the stories, of patriarchal stories. There may be exceptions to, again, to the rule, but then they do show that the rules can be broken and the direction of history changed. Uh, I'll stop here. I wasn't sure of the time, so I, I mean, I could go on, but uh, maybe, what do you say, Amna? Hello. I'm here. I'm just, uh, I think we can stop and take some questions if that's okay with you. And then um, hopefully that will trigger off further conversation with the. With yeah, the... I think that would be better because otherwise it's just, I mean, I could come up with another similar story, but it could be a surfeit. Uh -huh. Okay. So we have one comment in the comment question in the Q&A box, which is, just asking for reading recommendations about pre and post partition from South Asian non-white perspectives. Pardon? I, I, you'll have to be a little louder, Amna. Reading recommendations about pre post partition from South Asian non-white perspectives. Can you hear? If you um, let me look at chat. If you look at Q and A, look at the Q and A box and okay. at the bottom of your screen. Okay, reading recommendations. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, difficult to give suggestions from the from the top of my head. I think uh, Vivekananda uh, Taneja's genealogy is a good read. is is go good to start with. Uh, then you could also look at uh, Seymour's uh, pa Pakistan papers, the disputed legacies. It is not so much, it is colonial heritage and post-colonial narratives really, but the linkages are there. Uh, I'll have to think about it from the top of my head. I mean, I just, I've 
drawn a blank. Mm -hmm. What oh. else? Okay, so there's another question, um, which is from Zoya again. I also wonder about feminist positions pre-partition as I'm struggling with women in my family, suggesting that patriarchy is normal in Pakistani culture, and I just can't sit with that. So, so an elaboration of patriarchy. Well, women are part of patriarchy and they've internalized patriarchy and patriarchy not challenging uh, authority is a safe place to be in. And the women in the family are probably have opted to be comfortable in uh, within the status quo. They're not. I think you'll just have to talk your way through it. I mean, without, uh, I would suggest raising too many hackles, but to open up conversations, to make them ask questions themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are no hard and fast answers to how you deal with family members who are determined to not agree with you or see your point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we've all lived through it and we live through it still. Mm -hmm. yeah. So maybe, uh, maybe I can throw in a question as well, which is about connecting trying to think through your paper, which has, uh, which is fascinating. And there's so much, uh, so much in there that you've said um, that I'd like to chat about, but I'll just pick up a couple of points. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about then is this, this idea of the oral narrative and uncovering a lost passage. So, yeah. um, an open end, and, and you referred to Foucault and open ended conversations and the examples towards the end, especially with the sort of, I suppose it would be appropriate to call them from the real life stories, from the anonymized real life stories. Yeah, the Mai is a life story. I mean, I, I don't know if Mai is sitting up there or not, but I've seen the tree. And it's very interesting that you should take the lost passage as metaphor. Mm -hmm. Actually, at the time when we were going around the Lidarwaza in the old city, somebody had, to, uh, digging is illegal in the old city because there's too much archaeology, you know, too many layers of uh, built heritage and underground. But someone had dug the floor of their house, I think, maybe to add a, a basement or something secretly, and the floor had caved in. And it had revealed a passage, and there were murals, and it was near Sheramala Gate. And then the archaeology department came and locked it up. And given what the archaeology department does, I shudder to think what's happening to it. But uh, people are very aware of their own multi layered history. In fact, when we'd gone in, they were very suspicious of us. And then it turned out that. There is a belief generally that there is gold hidden in the walls of the old buildings. Gold left there at the time of partition, which mm -hmm. residents had not had the time to dig up and take with them. Mm -hmm. And I believe gold has been found. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, whether there's any still lying around, I don't know. But they thought we'd come gold digging, literally. And then by the time we were, so there are so many stories that exist side by side, half real, half popular belief, but very entwined with, with, with the history of the place and with partition and with the relationships. I mean, the generation of women we spoke to were too young to have known that time, but they spoke of it as if it had happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. And this this is another thing about uh, oral narratives, the way time collapses. The Neja mentions it in his genealogy in Firosha Kotla. And I personally experienced it in my village when an old aunt came and said, You're, you shouldn't, you people shouldn't have done that. So I said, done what? She said, sold that plot of land. So I said, who sold it? And said, your great grandfather did. But she was talking as if it had happened yesterday. And it was like a telescoping of time in 
places where the tempo of life is still very slow as opposed mm -hmm. so and again it is mm -hmm. how people perceive and experience their world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's uh, there's a lot there to unpack, and yeah, there uh, is can, one which is another question from S. Shazad uh, about or about romanticizing oral narratives. Absolutely, there's always a danger of romanticizing oral narratives because uh, they're such fun. But no, I'm not. As I said earlier in my paper, also in my presentation, also that I'm not arguing for a replacement of solid academic discourse with oral narratives, but the importance of factoring in people's memories, because academ academia tends to get rather self-referential, tends to occupy a discursive space, which then moves away from, from the ground at times. But particularly when official discourse is dealing with policy making, with peace things like peace negotiations, then other factors take over. And what is forgotten is the people who suffer, the displaced, the refugees, the immigrants, the loss of home. You know, it, it's a horrific situation to be in, but when we listen to the brokering of peace I'm in Afghanistan now, it is more about what the Taliban want and what about US wants and what about Pakistan, the states want, and not about what is happening on the ground to the people of Pakistan, who must be devastated after all these years of warfare. Mm -hmm. But yeah, as you say, point. they are unreliable. And, they say, and I've said so, they don't. It is emotional recall, it is can be inaccurate. It is how people remember things. And we people, we remember things differently all the time. We have another question from Odelia. How much of these stories, real or not, do you think affected the general societal patriarchal culture? Well, uh, I suppose stories are being told all the time. And it reminds me if there is time of Nazish Brohi's story, which I had wanted to talk about, where she talks about the anatomy of a rumor. And this is her experience of a field visit to Swat, where, and she'd been working there, so she knew the communities she uh, was meeting. She'd gone there to look at flood relief. And there in the conversation, one of the women had said that, uh, you know, and this is the time when the army had defeated, pushed out the Taliban and were there as a friendly entity and projecting their image as such. And uh, someone had said, you know, when uh, we've heard that when women go for aid or relief, they're asked to stri strip naked before they're given anything. So after her first natural reaction of shock, horror and anger, Nazish, when she was thinking about it that night, she, she couldn't quite believe it. It didn't make sense. Why would the army, at a time when it wanted to build a positive image of itself, act in this way? So she had dropped her the field work she'd gone for and gone from village to village trying to track the rumor. And she'd gone to the men and she'd gone to the women and she'd gone to the army also. And it was a violence that had not happened. And her dilemma was, what do you do in a context where violence is happening to its absence at the moment when someone is insisting on its presence? Because so many times violence against, I mean, most of the time violence against women is brushed against the carpet. It didn't happen, she asked for it, blah, blah, blah. And here she is in this double kind of a bind but, uh, and then she investigated it further and the men who knew it to be not true had not killed the rumor because they felt it was something that would intimidate the women and keep them in the house. And for women, they said, we've grown up all our lives with the fear of rape if we step outside, although most of the rape and violence that happens is in the home and not from strangers. 
But this was also the time when aid money had been coming in and uh, in order to uh, promote women's rights, aid agencies were giving money to women because they also felt that women would spend it on the homes and not waste it. So women were acquiring a new prominence. They were getting ID cards. They were getting a voice. They were stepping out of the house. So while women are negotiating space and asking for safe spaces to facilitate their entry into the public world, men are using the same rumor to keep them at home. So that is the way oral narratives also work. I mean, it depends on who's using them and what angle he or she picks up. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple more questions that have uh, mm -hmm. cropped up. There's one by S. Shahzad again. Would you say that our Eastern sensibilities make us more susceptible, more open to oral narratives? I missed the adjective. What sensitivities? Eastern. Eastern. I don't know. I'm a bit wary of stereotypes of Eastern and Western. I think... Uh, you find all sorts everywhere. But uh, I think our, uh, I think the fact that we are still an oral culture, the fact that we, our education system is in a shambles, the fact that we are not a, no longer a reading culture, and the fact that rote learning as pedagogical approach impedes our development for critical thought may have something to do with that. I don't think it has anything much to do with our being Eastern. I think, uh, I mean, the East has produced scientists like Salam and then uh, uh, in ancient history. Uh, who was it who discovered zero? That was a, an Oriental also, although from India. the other religion and uh, so no I am very wary of stereotypes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think there's something you it's a convenient ploy again to fit you into a box and keep you there and we live in interesting times when it comes to critical thinking and reading culture even here in in the UK because you find when states wish to pursue a particular political agenda education can play a very interesting yes. role in that kind of narrative and uh, the rote learning as pedagogical approach is actually quite useful whether you're in the east or the west in terms yes. of trying to manipulate the no, it's, it has its, I'm, I'm all for learning chunks of texts by heart which you can then cite i mean it's necessary for literature certainly to be able to quote accurately but uh, I think another thing which is, and now I'm going off, going off at a tangent and talking about education and the critical reflective capacity. I think the internet, the Twitter, the tweet, the emojis, I think they are eroding our capacity globally of complex, for complex thought. I mean, if you can express everything like the, again, the, Lacanian child whose cry says everything or nothing. I mean, if a, an emoji with a smile can express all your emotions, then it doesn't say much for the for the complexity of those emotions. It's a so new I think of diplomacy. <laughs> or maybe I'm old fashioned. Well, well, it'll be interesting to have the young people in in the in the audience speak up about this. But we have more questions. Ruchika Gurung, um, and apologies if I'm mispronouncing names, um, working, uh, says, working on a project based on oral narratives of women in regions of conflict, fight for a separate state in India in this case. One of our concerns has been the question of authenticity. So the question is around authenticity, whether that might be and the space that counter narratives occupy could you comment your, on your challenges of documenting oral narratives? Uh, well, the challenges are there. I mean, to begin with, when you go into the field, and I think anyone who has done that will have experienced it, nobody tells you the truth first time. 
you wouldn't either and i wouldn't either if a stranger walked in and asked me to tell them my fav- most favorite secrets or even ordinary details of my life so then again it depends on context and situation i mean it's a question of ga- gaining trust it's a question of time it's a question of maintaining confidentiality and uh, we found this not so much in the oral narratives uh, that we uh, encountered but in our work on uh, sexual and reproductive health where we were entering a rather sensitive area for pakistan tangentially because we hadn't gone in for reproductive health we had gone in to give uh, child sexual education and uh, there it was amazing what we uncovered not so much from from both parents and and the children and because i think we touched a nerve and a need with the children it was a very simple question of tell us what makes you happy and tell us what makes you angry and it was a group of young boys and they went on to good and bad touch and the fact that they could not speak to their parents about it because their parents would scold them and hence their greater vulnerability which we saw to to abuse and then when we took the issue to the parents their initial response was was their fear but again the cultural inhibition of we feel awkward discussing these matters with our children or they are too young to know but once that block had been removed then it was like uh, the flat gates opening and there was a sharing and i think that was the point where i mean obviously one can't swear with one's hand on a holy book that every word we heard was the truth but then every word we read in an official history or academic you know qualified academic discourse is problematic also you don't take it for you know you do question and challenge it but uh, i think up to a point you can get a sense of what may be closest to what's happening but uh, i don't think with any exactitude there are moments of insight and moments of understanding mm-hmm. that that's a really interesting question and and i like the answer a lot and i was also this morning attending the theater master class with um, aileen conant and one of the things that well, and i was it with minu gore i missed it no that was the film one um yesterday so that was great as well but it was with the theater director this morning and one of the things uh with regards to this kind of translation that question came up about cultural translation and also just about how which i think connects with this point about how do you translate people's narratives uh which even in in a kind of national space those narratives are so varied and different and you're even if you speak the same language you're still translating across a variety of positions and translations and she was talking about body language and and the visual being very important in terms of 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 sort of piecing together a story by by those people who are the players in that sort of performance piece and i was just wondering in 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 the act of collecting data and in the act of collecting information and oral narratives to what extent do those who who do that you know take that into account take those kind of body languages those those conversations that happen within a group or is it just more one to ones well farida sher who trained me and trained our field team also used to insist on field diaries and take keeping note of body language expressions tones and pitch of voice was part of the thing that the moment you got home you noted it down i mean obviously we didn't sit there taking notes in front of the people nor did we record their stories because that would have been an a violation of their privacy but language so that we do but language is a problem class is a problem i mean if somebody who even though punjabi has grown up in an urdu speaking home in say lahore goes to a village she is not going to understand a lot of things then again there is the uh, the 
two nation theory at home between the very elite schools and the public sector schools. And increasingly, the children who go to the high fee paying schools are insulated from the rest of the, the people. I don't know, it's a greater class consciousness or, or what? I mean, I remember, I mean, we, I went to the convent, but the convent was open to, I mean, A, it wasn't that high fee paying, but maybe the fee was high in those days, according to, to that time. But we had a lot of cultural and religious mix. We had Parsis, obviously Christians, the odd Hindu, and uh, the, the, the rest and the rest, though we didn't know who was Shia or Sunni at that time, that was to come later. But that that is missing. And I think those who are, uh, I mean, this is what I call the poverty of, uh, of privilege, really don't know what it is like to step out onto a dusty street. And if they go out, then they miss and they miss out. And there isn't that, they can't achieve that level of trust either because they don't have the language, they don't have the understanding, they don't understand the nuances, they don't understand the utensils. You know, the uh, jute, manji, or, uh, or cot, or some utensil, or the hand pump even. So they are very distanced. For them, it's all exotica. If you go with that mind mm -hmm. or that limitation, then it's going to be difficult. It's easier if you know the language and if you are uh, well used to walking the streets where people walk. Mm -hmm. And that makes a difference. Okay. So uh, we have another question, which is really interesting and, uh, and uh, something that we haven't talked about at all. Um, from Fozia Kane, she says, I am a descendant of the indentured diaspora are there any stories recorded outside India, Pakistan of memories or existing connections, family connections kept over the years? Hmm. I'm sure there are. I mean, uh, I know there is in my village, the Africa Valley aunt, who has now moved back after many, many years, but apparently that part of the family moved to Kenya uh, a few, a couple of generations ago and one of them has come back. So that kind of uh, connection remains, but no, to my personal knowledge, I, 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 I don't, I don't, I mean, if I dig around, I'm sure I'll find out, but uh, no, off the cuff, I can't think of anyone. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'm aware of some stories, but uh, they're not in my head at the moment. There's a couple of novels. Um, I don't know if you're looking for novels or if you're looking for archival stories. Fozia, if you have any uh, suggestions, perhaps you can put them or recommendations. You can also put them in, in, in the Q&A. So we still have time for more questions if people want to put them in the Q&A box we would be it would be great to hear them but I think that that question that about storytelling and about memories and family connections and what stories get told and what stories get heard that's that's really important and I and I wanted to ask you a little bit more you started with your with the story that looked back to the family and looked to Lahore and that sort of story of migration you know, what's the motivating factor in that, in sort of going back to that moment for you? Because it's often I find um, with, with... Anna, I don't think for me, and I don't know why it should be, because I, my memory of partition is very dim. It has always been an unresolved issue. It continues to be an unresolved issue. Uh, my early memories are of my grandfather was in the railways of trains full of refugees. I didn't know they were refugees. They were just trains full. I must have been about three or four at that time of trains full of people clinging to the doors on the rooftops, on the station, on the platforms and somebody saying refugees. 
And then because we were a political family, my father was involved in the freedom movement. At home, there was constant talk. And in fact, uh, who said they uh, say your father's gone to, uh, yeah, to push down the British rule? And I used to think British rule was some kind of a wall which he had, was pushing down. But uh, somehow it, uh, I don't know, my ch uh, early childhood was in Simla and in bits of Delhi and Allahabad. But I mean, nothing earth shattering happened there. What can happen to a child of three or four? But uh, I don't know, it has always remained an unresolved issue, which I, I think experienced on my first visit to Delhi. It was uncanny. It was a sense of belonging and not belonging, of wanting to own and not being able to own. And it was felt by Anu when she came to Lahore. Mm -hmm. I mean, two different women, two different histories. She was much younger. And uh, I think the cross-border friendships of family, of my father, of my aunts, which persisted. And then the forging of links ironically, in the col 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 colonizer's country mm. in England, uh, between Anu, Kumkum, Anya Lumba, Firdaus Azim of Dhaka. And uh, I think my, it was my supervisor who said, we were sitting there and he's chatting, and he said, you know, it's very strange that in this tiny England, mm. I'm not, two steps away from my house, I'm not sure who my neighbor is. Mm. And in this vast subcontinent, you people are sitting there chatting, not only do you know each other's families, do you never having met before until this moment, you also know scandals about each other's memories. I think it has something to do with the South subcontinent. It doesn't mm. let go. Uh -huh. That's... Uh... I think Amazing. the organic roots are very deep. I don't think I'm the only one mm -hmm. who who feels this way. Yeah, that's um, that's uh, it, it's. I think uh, those stories are, are really fascinating to hear and to, to. I suppose psychologically, if you think about it from the, from the perspective of somebody. And now that we're living in a time of the pandemic, I mean, a very different kind of time, a very different kind of trauma for many people in in terms of what they're experiencing in their parts of the world um it's it's interest it's important to think through you know the cycles of trauma and, and how generations and how it affects the younger generation in terms of it might not be the direct occurrence of the event that impacts on you directly but indirectly how does it sort of have a long term i i think Abna, it is also something to do with the uh, where things have panned out. If we had become our two separate nation states and lived happily ever after, mm -hmm. you know, but yeah. things are in a mess in both countries, economically, in terms of peace, and India, which set out to be secular, has turned out to be not very sec not so secular after all. So it is a, a kind of a a battle that is not ending. And you wonder what was the point of it all? All the killing, all the mayhem, all the destruction, all the uprooting, all the wrenching. I mean, each story is one more horrifying than the next. Mm -hmm. And what have we got out of it? I mean, common sense would say, let's stop fighting. We have common economic issues. We have common class issues. Let's sort them out. We have a common pandemic. Let's deal with it. But mm -hmm. uh, I mean, so much energy is wasted on uh, just bad mouthing each other mm -hmm. and well, on building hatred. And uh, I, I think, mm -hmm. and 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 I think, hatred is divisive. We started with India Pakistan hatred. There was the splitting of East Pakistan while well, we were using them as a colony. But then once India was out of the way, then we started fighting amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now that we've stopped, I mean, 
are not our minor, non-Muslim minorities are not enough. We are now fighting the Shias, mm -hmm. trying to create make them into a minority. Mm -hmm. So I think hatred and antagonism and divisiveness generates more and more of that. So in, in a sense, I think you've answered the question that nationalism needs an enemy, right? An, yeah. an enemy within to fight all the time, yeah. be it the Muslim in India, be it the Shia in Pakistan or some other minority. Uh, so so perhaps the broader question to think about also is, is, is the national framework. You know, I mean, in, in Britain, we've had, you know, Brexit. I mean, I don't know who will hate after Brexit, probably another minority community, um, yeah. somebody. So nationalism seems to work within very limited frames in that sense. Um, well, the nation state is inherently violent. It is built on exclusivities. It is built on control. It is built on compliance. OK, the nation state says, I'll sign a contract with you. But that contract is very easily re reneged upon the moment uh, authority thresholds are threatened or challenged. Mm -hmm. Then you raise security issues, you raise, mm -hmm. you cry treason, you do whatever you want to. Yeah, and I think your paper very nicely brought up those uh, issues within the nation state in terms of law and sovereignty and how those work or don't work for people and 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 the, the different kind of levels of justice systems that people are operating within and then the sexualities and gender. Which paper are you talking of? This paper that you've just been talking about oh. with regards to you were talking about the jirgas and the Okay, have I said all that? <laughs> I the civil society in terms of how uh, when the women are, uh, when a woman is raped and she does rely on a particular system the the legal system and how there are loopholes within the legal system which is not just over there i mean in, in terms of the legal system with regards to rape is quite problematic globally as well so those those sorts of things are are, are also that that sense of you know giving you rights within the nation state you know how does do how do those rights play out it's it's quite important to see those frictions and how they impact people like which which your paper brought out but there are more questions and comments coming up in the chat function so i'm going to turn yeah. to that uh fawzia there's a suggestion for fawzia from s shazad for a, uh, a book veiled i think it is for with regards to the indentured diaspora question veiled voyages by siobhan lambert non-fiction and I have remembered the fiction book that uh, I was thinking of, which a student of mine um, pointed me to uh, a year ago, Coolie Woman by Gayatra Bahadur. I can, um, I can put that in. Let me have the names by um, email because it's, I, I'm going to forget them in half a second. So these I are the ages. Yeah, sure, sure, of course, we'll do that. And Fawzia has also put a um, link in there um, with, in the Q&A. So, so guys, with the links and the suggestions for um, references, please feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, we can, um, for the Q&A, I'll go to the next question. Um, from Elena Khan, how do you feel the collection of historical oral narratives has shaped you as a person or the way you think over the years? That's for you, Neelam. Yeah, well, there's no single factor that shapes one. I think uh, stories have shaped me, starting with Grimm's, I think, and stories oral stories heard in, as a child and that was all part of the fantastic mm -hmm. and uh, then i think elders telling us about their childhood or their youth or their pre-partition lives i i think many factors shape one i don't know if uh, what part i mean it's i don't know what role or narratives may have played in my life, except for fanning the love of uh, uh, reading stories and listening to stories, and maybe wanting to go into the field and collecting 
more folk, folk tales before the folk tale dies out. And uh, looking forward to reading Harry Potter once this is over. <laughs> I've been looking forward to it all of all of yesterday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, thank you. There's another question um, from an anonymous attendee. How can we ensure that oral narratives collected from people won't get used by the hegemonic elites for nation building or other political purposes? For example, so that the liberation narratives collected from one ethnic group won't get used for oppressing other ethnic groups? So um, it, can it can happen. One has to be very careful. And especially in this days, in these days of the internet and instant communication, I think one has to be very careful about the information one passes off on unthinkingly. And uh, because uh, there are security factors, globally, I think, the security scene is uh, getting tighter. And information can be misused. I think one just has to be cautious. And if one puts a narrative in motion, I mean, you uh, respect privacy, but you also place them in a context which explains how you are reading it or how you are saying it, so that it is difficult for the other person to decontextualize and take it out, so it won't stop them from doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, Neelam, could you potentially give us an example from your work in Simur? Because I'm just extending extending this question beyond uh, the oral narrative collected from people uh, within the sort of nation, but also to what extent do you think global partners or the global north plays a role? in what kinds of narratives get collected through funding and resources that might not be available um, in countries? And could we also think about the question with regards yeah. to that? I think uh, we, I mean, Seymour has a lot of raw data on, on GBV, basically, uh, on how there was a time when we were looking at how women perceived violence and what we saw as violence was taken as fate by them. And so th there is a lot of material which has to be processed and uh, sort of sorted out. But uh, I think it has been important for us to respect, respect uh, privacy and to change names where we can, because we may come in and write a nice piece of research, but somebody out there may get it in the neck for having spoken out of, out of turn. Uh, the other thing with donors is one has to be careful. I mean, this is not donors so much as uh, I'm now talking of the 90s. Uh, journalists from Europe and the States coming to me and saying, can you in introduce us to uh, the LGBT groups in Pakistan? So I said, uh, no. I mean, not without their permission, not without, I mean, I'm not going to. And they were quite offended because they thought I was being uncooperative. But it's a question of maintaining privacy. And that is important. And uh, again, to cite a donor, this was somebody who would come here and they were interviewing young men and women on sexuality and their sexual experience and then went and made the whole thing public and it was very wrong because I mean one of the one young man approached us he said this woman came through you and we trusted you and there's my name there and what if my mother sees it <laughs> that that kind of thing you know because culturally I think we are not very we don't go public about our private lives, at least about our private sexual lives. Mm -hmm. And here was this, uh, I think she was from Canada, uh, giving chapter and verse, including name, and uh, giving details, which was, uh, I mean, we yelled at her, but that was all we could do. But, but 
we've learned to be wary ever since. And I think people also are less open because of this fear. Mm -hmm. that, that's interesting to hear because in one of the panels that we had um, on the first day of the festival, my colleague was who's working on this great project on African screen worlds was talking about um, about sort of the co-production of knowledge and also the funding that they receive to try and change the perspective from capacity building, um, from the pressure to do capacity building in the global south and to disseminate funding through that kind of um, model to try and make <clears throat> the global south partner a more equal partner in terms of how that relationship is negotiated and how it, how the landscape for us as well uh, when it, it is like we have to change it as well in in terms of how we as researchers are getting the funding from here mm -hmm. and to in what way we develop the relationships and work with with the groups because i think that question about sharing information across ethnic groups and what gets um used from one group to the next is also it's not just a local question it's also a global question because it's yeah. definitely the case that that there is so much that's involved in that so i think it's really interesting to hear your perspective in terms of how when i mean you've, you've talked about journalists coming in and uh, donors uh, i suppose you haven't mentioned and, and maybe no, it's and there is also this uh, increasing religiosity Mm -hmm. which is becoming problematic because any comment can be taken as uh, anti-Islamic or as irreverent. Mm -hmm. So really what is happening is that criti crit critical thought and reflection is being blocked and so is critical discussion. Because half the time if you're looking over your shoulder to see, am I being misunderstood? Because what you mean as a straightforward academic question, the other may see as an insult. Mm -hmm. so, and, the uh, effects, huh? so, so, so that is a problem. That is increasingly a problem. Okay, all right. So great. Uh, so culture of offense is, is definitely something that uh, we could talk a lot more about, but I'll pick up some more questions from the chat box. And <laughs> there's a <clears throat> comment by S. Shahzad. Uh, I think this is, again, going answering uh, that thread from El, from Fosia earlier about um, narratives and he says or she there are also pages on Facebook dedicated to recounting personal narratives of people from all walks of life from various cities of Southeast Asia modeled on humans of New York so um, brilliant please uh, feel free to send us any links and um, Fozia says Gitra Bahadur's book, Cooley Woman, is excellent. Great. Good to hear. And we have a question from Mad, 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 Mad I'm, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, you said that most responses are of avoiding telling partition stories because they don't want to relive the trauma. Yeah. Do you have stories which ended up being therapy facing the past? So, uh, very interesting question. Yeah, yeah. No, with my cousin whom I uh, cited, when we started talking, she got into the flow of it and there was a lot of, I mean, Sadi and I had gone there for a short interview. We were there for, I think, five hours. But, and I think somewhere it was a, a, a getting it out of her system but you also know that as therapy once we you begin to relive the past it can be very painful also and i think while at one level she said it all at another level it was a painful experience because there were too, there was too much pain connected with the even while she was talking uh, she said when we were leaving Batala, and they had come for a short while, the idea was that once the trouble died down, they would come back, but no point in staying. And then they never came back. And she said there was some sense in me that some sense of finality, because she had gone around the house touching the walls of each room. 
although they came with very little left most of their stuff behind because they said thought they'd be coming back and uh, and she said we lost our sense of bearings over here we had a sense of rootedness in batala which they lost here on the other hand she then went to college here which from coming from a conservative family she may not have had a chance to, of doing while in if it stayed on so it's a but uh, i know that members of that family there were one or two who after that one trauma of displacement would not leave lahore risk their jobs but would not go to another city if the posting was there so it did it did leave its traumas and uh, i think i mean obviously there must have been healing or a papering over i just feel that it went too deep it was too much of a wrenching of an organically grown community I mean, as i said it's a the an old city was a mosaic pieces fitting in and uh, obviously if women are still lighting lamps then something must some there must be some lack something must have been left empty which is still remembered although this generation would not know partition and now since uh, Uh, the afghan war and all, all that there's a new influx of a new population which is the uh localized afghans who have moved in so another culture and there's another layer of history being added to the old city i believe there's a lot of pashto being spoken there now mm-hmm. so history moves on mm-hmm. okay so uh In a sense, I mean, we. Uh, I'm just think looking at the time. We have ten uh, more minutes because it's four thirty-five. Just so I really gave a short piece. I was so scared of going on and on. I could have made it longer. Not at all. So this, if you wanted to add anything at this moment in time, this is. Uh, uh, would you well, like to? I would. Have, I would have given more something? time to the case studies because mm-hmm. there was Nazish's case study, which I wanted to look at. and another one to give a kind of a broader view i just thought there wouldn't be the time and there was no point in uh, uh, trying to squeeze in too much mm-hmm. i think we've had a very uh, Im- interesting wide ranging conversation because it's gone from <laughs> excuse me from the subjugation of memory at a very personal level to the more uh, broader national regional local exchanges and journeys that you've had in your work as an activist and as somebody who is also an archivist in many ways uh, c- collecting these stories and collecting the memories and i think i, I was thinking of your first slide where you had the uh, reference to fuko and that sense of um subjugated knowledges that that underpins your overall lecture with regards to the how how sort of knowledges are subjugated through through kind of this idea of common sense or how narrat- a, a narrative is constructed and, and and i liked that story of going to the city of you picking up that story in the city in the inner city in the space in the architectural spaces of the city right you know using oral memory uh, but also using the physical city spaces to to dig out an archive to try and um think i think of those knowledges that are buried literally i mean it was fascinating mm-hmm. to, to hear that you know to to kind of think what is the tunneling out that that we need to do I think next time you come we'll go to the city the city more or less takes over and narrates its own story mm-hmm. the streets the markets the people mm-hmm. the language the dialect 
and and its own particular culture i'm not saying it's a fantastic culture and i agree with every word that is said i mean it's as it's i mean it's conservative people at one level but it's also uh, a younger generation which is where things are changing girls are going out for work girls are getting jobs girls are bringing in money so that dynamic is changing and generating its own own tensions and its own breed of violence also mm-hmm. where men are willing to accept the earnings but not willing to accept the mobility mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. freedom that it mm-hmm. with it and there is that kind of a uh, 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 sort of oppositional pull which uh, which is pretty dangerous also at times mm-hmm. well i think there's a great connection between your paper and uh, meenu gore's um zindabad class yesterday on on zindabad the film which i would recommend for everyone it's because that's a lovely film awesome. it's a lovely film and and why i'm recommending it and why i'm saying this is a great companion to neelam's lecture is because she was talking about it yesterday with iftikhar dadi and the, and and sort of emphasizing that it's about a crisis of masculinity as well and and that yeah. need to to flee the city to f- migrate outside you know to to go to the middle east or wherever because there is an intense pressure from the family on on the men to make the money and um that in itself engenders a kind of familial violence that puts pressure and that pressure gets translated in so many different forms and and i mean it was really interesting how she done it through humor but also can i can i get a recording of that yes yes absolutely it's it's actually we we've live streamed it on facebook so you can um i will okay. send you the link okay do send it yeah send because it. i wanted to yesterday i just couldn't i didn't have the couldn't link in mm-hmm. oh sorry to hear that but but i think it's a fantastic <clears throat> like your your paper and hers um that conversation links up really uh, nicely with regards to how we think about gender and storytelling mm-hmm. within this this kind of uh, creative storytelling uh, sociological storytelling anthropological narratives uh, through the oral storytelling framework and and the creative stories that that you've also spoken about in the earlier lectures from the oral culture that uh, that's around uh, that people grow up with and respond to and then the written tales um so so lots lot you've given us a lot of food for thought do you have any i don't think we have any more q and a questions um do you have some final thoughts to to give well, us before we say goodbye talking about the old city and zindabad is very much in the old city also or in a, around it so it does go into punjab club also but uh, uh one of the things we did in the old city was watching television with women Mm-hmm. because they at that time were watching these two star plus soaps i don't know if you've heard of them saas bhi kabhi bahu thi and kahani ghar ghar ki mm-hmm. i watched them for two years it created a tremendous bonding amount of bonding between me and my mother but since then i've not been able to watch <laughs> watch television actually sort of but uh, there's a lot of violence in them of mothers in law striking out at daughters in law and daughters in law putting poison in mother mother in law soups and we said how do you i think the women found it cathartic they mm. enjoyed the fashions they knew those fashions were not for them a because of the exp- the you know the, the expense b because of the unsuitability i mean in the old city you don't go around in a black backless blouse or a sleeveless you know though they're all wearing jeans once they're inside their homes or going off to work but uh, it was the gratuitous violence which they enjoyed and i think that was cathartic but because most of them do have mothers in law who are, who are nasty and most of them have do have daughters in law with whom they don't get on mm-hmm. so anyone giving a resounding slap to <laughs> one or the other was somewhere felt good and what they also enjoyed was the occasional slap given by the mother to the son 
and I think that also appeased a lot of <laughs> heartburn in many breasts. Mm -hmm. But it was a kind of a voyeuristic, at one remove kind of engagement. But they watched them all. I mean, from and there, there were patterns from six in the evening to ten at night. Then the men came home because there's a big retail market over there in Shahalmi. Mm -hmm. the men come home and the TV is handed over to them and the women go around getting food ready and things. And then the men watch wrestling and news and uh, mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. that the women are not interested in. So it was very interesting, the patterns. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's great. I mean, I'm thinking of my own household and, and, <laughs> and the struggle with the remote control who controls yes. it in the evening. But, uh, but that's just sort of trivializing it a little bit. Uh, what you're saying, which is uh, very important. There are a couple of um, comments that have come in and, and there's a question which unfortunately we won't have time to get into from AG, uh, which is it's important to get such narratives into civic space as they contribute to a sense of nationalism, cultural values and historical layers <clears throat> which build a society. How can we use these cases and narratives to positively impact civic space? So question about civic society, how do we build a sense of um, sense of that through through storytelling, if, if I've understood correctly? I think storytelling, which engages people with the lives of others and takes them beyond their own 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 spaces. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you empathetically engage with another, even if it is through a story, you have stepped out of yourself a bit. And maybe you're no longer the center of your own, your self-referentiality is diffused. I think to empathize with another and stories do help that. Literature does it. I mean, that, that's the fantastic thing about literature. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. You so I think get that's... under the skin of a Lady Macbeth and and understand her, mm -hmm. and uh, also of uh, a Macbeth or an Ophelia or a Heer or a Ranja or a Sony or a Mahibal or whatever, whatever, or or the ordinary girl in the street, the little girl. I mean, like the girl in the again in the old city who was talking about. These are poor people. Most of it's a low income area. They were talking about their social life, and uh, a lot of them said, "No, we don't go go out too much to weddings and things." So somebody said, "Why do you, your father doesn't let you?" And they said, "Well, that's what we say, but we don't have the clothes." And rather than admitting that we don't have the as, you know, we can't go on wearing the same dress to five different different occasions, we say, "Father won't let us." He said, "Father doesn't stop us." It's, it's other things. So, and suddenly you get an insight into a life of scarcity, of economic lack, and of youth and aspiration and wanting to look pretty and wanting to party and not being able to. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think it, some of the stories do humanize one, or should at least. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I, I don't know what, what about the civic space, but. <laughs> I think, I think that's a good, good sort of literature. To, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm cutting in because I can sort of feel the pressure from my, uh, from my tech team coming in now. <laughs> thank you, Sunil, for patiently waiting for us to wrap up. A big thanks to Sunil and to other members of the team. I'm, I'm not sure who is in the background um, uh, with him. So thank you for supporting this session and thank you to everyone attending. Uh, thank you to Neelam, and um, I will quote Kevin, who has expressed his appreciation of the panel, saying what an amazing insight. So Neelam, more power to you. And so also from Yasser Paracha, who expresses his enthusiasm for the talk. I think um, I think we, we definitely have to talk again, and the next time it has to be about uh, about weddings and soaps and all sorts of things that, that are sort of such big major sort of parts of people's lives in that in should be fun 
<laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Neelam. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. I, I enjoyed the chat. Okay. Thank and you. I, yes, but was I audible? I've been so nervous about it ever since I heard the first recording and I can't hear myself. 